This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Notice and Disclaimer This transmission, including attachments, is the work of a deranged mind and contains little, if any, information that has any basis in the real world. Unless you are the intended recipient or are authorized to receive it for the intended recipient, you may not copy, forward, disseminate, or otherwise disclose its contents. If you received this transmission in error, please notify us immediately, permanently delete it from your system, and burn all hard copies, including the hard disks that stored it, immediately. This is for your own protection, as we cannot accept liability for third-party reprisals arising from use of this transmission. Any opinions expressed herein, including attachments, are those of the author and do not necessarily reflect reality. We will not accept responsibility for any commitments made by the above sender and do not warrant the accuracy or completeness of any such information. Thank you. The Funeral, written by Larry M.H. 54, performed by Chris Heron. The black limousine followed the hearse down the cemetery access lane, followed by a 17-car funeral procession. The procession stopped near a freshly dug grave, and mourners began making their way to the graveside. The eight pallbearers gathered at the back of the hearse, and the driver rolled the casket halfway out of the vehicle. Talking in low tones, the men could be heard as they lifted the casket and carried it toward the gurney. Poor Miguel. We gotta do something for his parents, man. Do you know they didn't even have him embalmed? No money, man. That's why the service was a closed casket. He probably don't look too good by now. Man, this is so weird. Miguel was our age. And for him to die in his sleep like that? Gabriel affected a shiver. I still think it had something to do with the accident he said he wasn't involved in, Angelo said. Did you see the front end of his cruiser? Berto said. Just as they reached the curb, someone tripped, dropping his end and knocking everyone off stride. The corner of the casket hit the ground, hard, just inches from the gurney. The fallen pallbearer got up and dusted himself off. Gabriel said, Hey, Louis, you trying to wake him up? I wish I could, man, the clean-shaven young man said. They lifted the casket and placed it on the gurney. Nobody just dies like that. There wasn't a mark on him, he continued. Madre de Dios, you think he'd at least have a bullet hole in him or something, eh, I say? Ah, shut up, Berto. You know he wasn't like that, Pablo said. They guided the casket to the graveside and lifted it down to the elevator mechanism, then moved to their folding chairs. Yeah, he wasn't into flying saucers and stuff, another pallbearer, Juan, said. Guys, keep it down, Manny reminded them. The service is starting. For the next half hour, the friends sat quietly, listening as the priest comforted the family and described Miguel's heavenly reward. Miguel woke with his head forced against his chest. He'd felt a few moments of vertigo, and he seemed to shift downward, relieving the pressure on his neck. Trying to scoot backward into a more comfortable position, he realized that the dark place he was in was also claustrophobically small. What the? He reached out, exploring the black space he seemed to be trapped within. It was soft and deeply upholstered, almost like a... a coffin. What the hell? he exclaimed. Hey, what's going on? Let me out. Is anyone out there? Hello? He reached up and tried to bang on the lid, but was frustrated by the thickness of the padding and the small size of the space above him. It seemed designed to swallow every sound he made whole. He stopped to listen, but could discern nothing, only phantom lights playing in the darkness before him, the illusory response to total light deprivation. Where am I? The funeral home? No, I was scrunched up in the corner there, in the cemetery. Buried? Or worse? They wouldn't cremate me, would they? Shit, it's cheaper too. I bet. Oh God, don't let me burn. 
Let me out of here! He started banging futilely on the lining again, then tried tearing at the fabric that cocooned and muffled him so effectively. But with so little room to move, he couldn't get much leverage. The fabric was new and strong. Nothing. No knife. No keys. What can I use? I gotta get this thing open! His breathing was beginning to quicken. Oh shit, how long have I been in here? How much time do I have? Hey, is anybody out there? Can anybody hear me? Panic deepened, seizing in his throat, but also giving him the strength to rip a few stitches out of the padding. Encouraged by the sound, he retraced his hand movements, trying to locate the rip in the darkness. His fingers caught on something. Grabbing at it with both hands, he pulled the tiny tear wide, releasing an avalanche of fabric or cotton wadding or some such material. Some of it landed on his face, tickling and threatening to suffocate him as he wiped and blew heedlessly at it, then returned to ripping the fabric from the space above him. He shoved as much as he could down toward his feet, but still more material seemed always up there. He felt his arms weakening as the oxygen levels dropped and carbon dioxide increased. Soon, he was able to do little more than breathe, a shallow panting that seemed to do little if any good at all. Slowly, his consciousness began fading, and he began dreaming wild and desperate dreams of space aliens and of trying to breathe vacuum far away in the fathomless depths of space. A voice and a face seemed to float into his mind. Looking like an angel with short golden hair and a well-proportioned body, a young man, looking like he should be named Sven, smiled at Miguel. We've been trying to reach you for some time now, he said. There is little time left before your world enters the new harmonic convergence. When it does, there will be a telepathic referendum and your world will be raised up into the next level of awareness, or it will be sent back down for another ten thousand years of slavery to the old paradigm. You must— Oh, come on, man. I'm dying here, and you're gonna push that bullshit off on me now? Goddamn alien freaks. Fuck, man, I want to talk to Jesus, or Mary, or someone, not you. What's the matter with you, you fucking freaks? Back off! Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. But this is important. You've got to tell... I don't got to tell nobody nothing. I'm going to be dead in a minute, so shut up. Where's that fucking tunnel of light? Blessed are thou among women, and... The service had ended, and the small crowd evaporated, leaving only the four friends now standing beside a shedding birch tree. Man, Louis, if Father O'Brien knew what you were going on about, he'd have you excommunicated in a heartbeat. When did Miguel start with that alien crap anyway? I don't know, man. Maybe a couple months ago? What's that got to do with anything? Manny said. Nothing, I guess. I was just remembering how tired he seemed there towards the end, like he wasn't getting enough sleep. I didn't think an aneurysm could do that, said Berto. Hey, man, maybe he was, like, getting abducted or something, eh? Pablo joked. <laughs> yeah, like they wouldn't let him get his rest. Maybe he crashed his cruiser because he was too sleepy, continued Louis. Manny flushed with anger at the exchange. Will you two stop it? What, he forgot he crashed his ride? I don't think so. Maybe the aliens crashed it for him, Louis volunteered. Oh, right. Little green guys hot-wiring a classic 69 Impala and jumping into a brick wall. Called the Inquisitor. Stop the presses. They're not green, they're gray. Don't you read the papers? Pablo corrected. They're not gray, they're imaginary. Don't you have any sense? Manny retorted. It's not right, man. Miguel had a long life ahead of him. It's like they stole it from him, said Louis. God, you talk like they're real, said Manny. Guys, they're not imaginary. They're over there. Pablo's voice rose an octave, and he pointed past the gravesite to a silver shape just over a hill, maybe half a mile away. Ah, come on, Pablo. That's just a water tank. Oh, man, I'm not seeing this, Louis said. Look at that. It's taken off. As they watched, 
the silver disc rose into the air and flew faster and faster toward them. It shot past maybe twenty feet above their heads, then angled up and vanished into the blue. God, did you see that? Berto cried. It's like they wanted us to see them. What did they want? What did they care about a simple funeral? Pablo shaded his eyes and tried to follow its tracks. I don't know, man. Maybe they were listening, said Pablo. I've heard that they can read your mind, Louis said. Yeah, right. Like they really want to hear anything you're thinking, Manny said scornfully. And they talk to you telepathically, Pablo said. Right. They told you Miguel isn't dead and we better get him out of there before he croaks, Manny said. All three of them stopped and looked at Manny. Seconds passed as they realized that they had all had the same thought. They looked at each other for a moment longer and then silently ran back to the graveside. Louis jumped into the hole as the backhoe was driving up with the concrete lid. The driver shut the engine off. Hey, kid, get out of there. What do you think you're doing? The operator exclaimed. Louis just reached down and began unlocking the latches to the casket. The others arrived and stopped at the edge of the grave. Not so fast, Obrero. We gotta check something. Hey, you can't open that. It's illegal. You gotta have papers. Louis moved back and, grabbing the lid, pulled it back. The casket lid was shredded up to the metal housing. Miguel's lips were blue and he was covered in torn bits of cloth and foam. Miguel, are you dead, man? Louis grabbed his shirt and pulled, slamming him up and down in the casket for a few moments until Miguel took a deep breath on his own. <gasps> Louis, you heard me. Oh, thank God. I thought I was done for. Get me out of here. Louis helped his friend get out, and the others pulled them both out of the hole. The backhoe operator, who had taken out his cell phone, relayed the news to his boss as the reunited friends walked away, surrounding Miguel. As they walked, he looked around at his friends. Any of you guys ever heard of a harmonic convergence? Larry Hooten, or Larry H. as he likes to sign off, is a disabled, semi-retired 64-year-old machine builder, electronic technician, assembler, driver who loves to read about science and technology and to write. His writing style has been compared to Tom Clancy's, but he's never fulfilled the promise that comparison makes. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that, and I really hope my accents weren't too bad. I've never actually attempted a Spanish accent before, so this was a first for me. But if you did like the story, definitely check out all of Larry's other stories on the channel. He's got quite a few at this point. I'll make sure to leave links in the description to where you can find them all in one place. And of course, be sure to subscribe. This show is available on YouTube, Facebook, and just about every podcast app available. I'm Chris Heron, and that's it for today's Tall Tale TV.